Hey everyone and welcome. This is Jack Butler and I'm excited to be here today talking with Jonathan Astley who is a very successful YouTuber. He's got a great channel. You should check it out. I'll link it beneath the video. And we are here talking about why women accept casual when they are looking for committed. So Jonathan, welcome to the channel. Well, I'm so I'm so grateful that you reached out to me. I I want you to know I followed your work as well, and uh, yes, and I really appreciate your personal development take in how you approach, um, you know, whether it's dating, mating, or relating, yeah. or just individual growth. And and so I want you to know you were on my radar. So when you reached out, I'm like, oh, I'm excited. Yes, <laughs> yes. no, it's good. I appreciate that. Yeah. So one of the reasons I, I was keen to get you on the channel is that you have done a lot with working with women in dating over 40. Yeah. So if anyone's you know in that category and listening, I want you to pay particular attention. So we're going to dialogue here a bit. So let's just, just dive in because you were saying some stuff before we got on here that I thought was really interesting. Um, sure. So what's your take on, on this question? Why are women accepting casual when they're really wanting commitment? Well... I'm going to go down a rabbit hole here for everyone that's watching. So just bear with me for a second. And um, just to give some context, yeah, um, I, um, after turning 40 and going through a divorce about a decade and a half ago, I found myself in the dating marketplace. And it was a completely yes. different world because in my generation, um, there was no internet. We met people organically. And now that there's the internet and I thought, oh, what a great way to meet someone. You just plug in exactly what you want and someone would magically appear. And <laughs> after one, and I'd meet, a, I'd meet a, yeah, I'd meet a really nice gal. We'd have a great date, but something wasn't right. I'd meet another one, nice gal, great date. Another one, something, you know, something wasn't right. Quite frankly, I had over a hundred internet dates in my first wow. year. Wow. In a year. Yeah. Oh, in a wow. year. I literally was two a Took week. Well, and, and I had even a short lived relationship in there. Um, what I found the problem wasn't the women, the problem was me. So yeah. I actually began doing work uh, under individual work, personal development, self-help, spiritual work yeah. to, um, to get a sense of what, what am I doing wrong? And, and I don't like even characterizing the word wrong, but yeah. ineffective. And what was interesting was I was actually communicating with so many women. They were asking my advice about men, dating relationships, their profile, that I switched professions from the insurance field to helping give advice oh, on goodness. just to improve dating yeah. profiles. Yeah. And and I, I grew to such a point where I've, I've actually established I'm actually, you know, I I'm in the like second tier of the top tier people. Uh, that are in this industry, if you will. And I, I mean yeah. that there are people more successful than me, but I'm quite successful. Um, what I recognized was when I was in my 20s, and, and I'm answering the question now, when I was in yeah. my 20s and 30s, um, I was very programmed. And I'm of that baby boom Gen X period. I'm yeah. right at the cusp of that age bracket. My programming was uh, go to college, get a job, meet a gal, get married, buy a house, start a family. That was my programming. So when I was in my 20s, I was on the hunt for a wife. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and all my friends were on the hunt for a wife because we had this programming about family. Yep. Then at 40, I went through a divorce and I was a train wreck for easily five years. I was a disaster, emotionally speaking. Mm -hmm. And yet I craved companionship. I yeah. craved connection and I yeah. craved sex. What yeah. was missing was commitment. Yeah. Two reasons. A, I was gun shy to commitment. Of course. But B, I didn't know what commitment looked like because the demographic I was dating and roughly, you know, I say this is anecdotal, but roughly 75% of people over 45 years old are divorced. Yeah. And divorce comes with it an emotional entanglement. It's an it's a unraveling of the tapestry of a life you thought you were going to build. Yeah. And now it's 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 you know it's like it's frayed. So what commitment looks like, in particularly for those of us in forty, divorce, maybe children or whatnot, is ambiguous at best. Yeah. Now we, we think of monogamy and exclusivity as forms of commitment. Yeah. But after that, you know, you can, you know, you can break up with anyone, you know, someone at any given time. 
You know, there isn't really any deep roots of commitment. And what men in particular is they don't have the blueprint of what commitment looks like after getting married, you know, after going through a divorce. And what I mean to say is short of marriage again. And if you're gun shy of short marriage again, yeah. is it is commitment living together? Is commitment sharing finances? Coming together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so so now coming back to your question, why are women accepting casual to commitment? It's because we've been indoctrinated in believing that chemistry equals relationship success. You know, lust and limerence, you know, that happens in early stage. Oh my God, we lust for each yeah, other. Yeah. yeah. And and yet, why do women find themselves six weeks later after you know they've been intimate with someone, all of a sudden he says, I'm not ready for a relationship? was because men right off the bat, a significant percentage aren't committed to the idea of commitment. Do you say they aren't committed to the idea? Of they are not committed yeah. to the idea of commitment. They're not They're, looking for it. Yeah. Now yeah. they might say the words I'm, I'm seeking a relationship, but remember I said earlier, companionship, connection, and sex, the fourth leg, and I really should say, if I want to keep them all C's, companionship, commitment, and coupling, okay? Okay. The, <laughs> the, fourth, C, the fourth C that's missing is commitment. And yeah. because they don't know what it looks like for them. You're and, saying they don't know what the deeper purpose is, is if there's not the purpose of kind of creating family, children together, exactly. and there's maybe not the purpose of marrying or marrying again. Interesting. So wait, so you're actually saying in a way that the issue as I'm hearing it so far is a little bit more on the side of men. Oh, absolutely. And, okay. and, and so it's the men in particular, not that men are, you know, if we've been indoctrinated in a traditional expectation that men are the leaders of the relationship. Um, because traditionally speaking, men have been the provider protectors and they yeah. say, I'm going to take you in my home. I'm going to protect you and I'm going to provide for you. Okay. Now you've got this group of men. They're like, I don't know if I want to be provider protector. You know, I just went through a nasty divorce. I've got to pay alimony. I've got this person that's beating down my neck. And it, and for some men, they have contentious relationships with their ex. That idea of provider protector and yeah. a lot of people and, and a lot of people in our realm, um, particularly, I believe, female coaches overemphasize this without understanding because I'm a man. I went through a divorce. The yeah. last thing I wanted to be, and I went through a contentious divorce. The last yeah. thing I wanted to be was a provider protector for someone. But everybody says, but that's biological. Well, guess what? Biology was for the cavemen for 30 years because that's about as old as a caveman ever got. There's no cavemen that made it to age 60 and went through divorce and alimony and child support and visitation rights. And, you yeah. know, and there was no, so you wait, know, just, uh, just on that specifically, do you think yeah. anything has changed um, sort of substantively since, you know, you know, the seventies and eighties, because there was also a decent divorce rate happening then. The, the thing that you mentioned that's different is, is sort of online. Um, but do you think this was the same situation that people were dealing with 40 years ago? Or do you think something is unique to this time? So the proliferation of divorce coincides with the a woman's capacity to no longer be dependent upon a man to support herself throughout yeah. history. When you are dependent, you might have compromised yourself to, to stay with a person that might be miserable, but you had no choice to leave. So yeah. abruptly in the, when women were, uh, had the fortune to be, to be able to support themselves financially, it allowed them to exit relationships outside of dependency. Yeah. Now, um, so that's number one. Number two, I think the advent of birth control has also shifted the narrative because now sex can be done on a casual level and no longer on a committed level. Yeah. So comes back to our title, casual versus committed. Women are accepting casual relationships because there's this belief that it's going to turn committed at some point in the future. And in many cases, you're dealing, if I said earlier, if a man isn't committed to the idea of commitment, he just wants casual, 
you know, he might say the words, I want a relationship, but the word relationship can have multiple meanings to multiple different people. Sure. What does yeah. it mean? Yeah. Yeah. And it's now probably even what the word we call an essentially contested concept, like until you define it. Yeah. Not, and so, you know, a woman's clear. idea of relationship might look something like this. And the guy's like, yeah, I just want to see you at my beck and call. And that space in between is called drama, by the way, <laughs> yeah. um, because the desire Terrible of this. Stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm a, so wait, so, I, so what I'm hearing is actually that yeah. maybe because you, you, the, the two things that you pointed to there about uh, proliferation of divorce rates and birth control, again, they have been around for quite a you know, number of decades. And um, so I'm I'm wondering if this is actually something that people have been dealing with for a number of decades, but maybe actually people want more or different on both sides of the equation from what what is this relationship going to be if it's not about creating a family together or we already have that or I don't want it or I'm not capable of it or whatever that's the yeah. piece is there. What do you think is the best way for a woman to approach uh, articulating what she's actually looking for in a relationship beyond just maybe saying commitment? Like what would be the, yeah. the best pitch authentically to a yeah. guy to say, this is why maybe we want to have a committed relationship? So I, I think it's important, and I, I want to address that question. I mean, and at the same time, there was one other piece I didn't include prior, and I want to add that. So we said women's capacity to take care of themselves began to increase. We have birth control. And again, since the 70s, you know, I, I'm yeah. saying this is it's a 50 year evolution here. Um, what's changed in the last 20 years is this thing. And the ease of access to people who wouldn't otherwise be in your your, yeah, your social visual scene. circle i mean yeah. not your social circle or actually i say it your visual circle because it was everything was proximity based now at a click of a finger you know a guy can be communicating with he lives in los angeles can communicate with someone in chicago and begin a yeah, interlude and, and go and have you know meet them have sex and then say oh i'm not ready for a relationship so I just wanted to add that piece that's changed so much so in the last 20 years. And really, it's mm -hmm. the last five years of swipe dating that has bastardized the mating process, okay, because of this belief of the paradox of choice. In other words, we have this belief yeah. that we have so many choices, and that's what's changed in the last five years. Now, to come back to your question, one of the things I teach in my private coaching is something I call radical honesty, um, mm -hmm. pre-qualifying your prospect. It's really about laying your cards on the table very early on before you ever get attached to another human being. And the new term for this is called hardballing. Hardballing is like, look, you know what? This is what I want. If you're not on the same page as me, then you know there's no need to even take this any further. Mm -hmm. um, and that's my now this is going to scare off 90 percent of men but these are the 90 percent that they're not committed to the idea of commitment mm -hmm. you know i want to get your take on something is it okay if i share with you with you, you and your audience um something i call the dating vows and it's something to address early on in the dating process i'm going to read it um, it goes like this. Have you ever heard the saying, women are the gatekeepers of sex and men are the gatekeepers of commitment? Mm -hmm. Like, And nowadays, sex could be given without any commitment. And I mean, yeah, there might be the agreement of monogamy and exclusivity, but that's, that's still a weak form of commitment. So the dating vow before sex states the following. Each person agrees to the following. I agree to explore the process of getting to know you with the intent to declare something serious within the next three to six months. You're both sharing this. I agree to be monogamous sexually while we have regular sex together. I agree to not actively seek to meet and date others while we're in the dating process, including taking down my dating profile. I agree to speak up if this isn't working for me versus pulling back, ghosting, or disappearing. And I agree to invest regular time in the process to get to know you, which looks like we spend three or four days and nights a week together doing shared activities, hobbies, mutual interests, spending time yeah. with family and friends. Um, teamwork in both our personal and professional life. So I like it. My clients have been adopting this and it's scaring off. It scares 90% of men. When are they introducing it into the conversation? 
very early, ideally they want to do it before there's sex or certainly if there's going to be regular sex, but I invite them to do it prior to them giving their heart to a man. Yeah. Because I'm not here okay. to say, you know, each woman can handle sex differently. Although women have a propensity to get attached once there's sex. I mean, we've talked about oxytocin, not you and I haven't talked about, but I mean, most everyone yeah. who follows us, we've heard those, uh, heard about oxytocin, estrogen, all those sorts of things. It's really tick tricky. So I invite deeper conversations on the first phone call. Yeah. Like you got nothing to lose. You're not attached to a person. If they go, oh, this feels like an interview. I'm like, yeah, it is. We should be interrogating people. I'm, I, and I say this, I don't say this cavalierly. It yeah. is, a, it is a, it, listen, just like a detective interviewing a suspect for murder, you have to navigate, and I'm being candid here. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a methodology to do this. This is what I teach in my coaching, but there's a methodology to evoke it without it seeming like an interrogation. Uh, but we yeah. don't, at, at our age, for those of us in midlife and, you know, I'm not that far, you know, I'm in, you know, over 55, you know, the days in front of us are shorter than the days behind us. We don't have time to mess around when you're over 40. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I was just making maybe the distinction between, um, here's what I'm looking for, right? I'm looking for, you know, a real relationship or a committed relationship, yeah. which is, uh, different than what you, you know, I love what you talked about with the dating vows. Yeah. That's, that's like a we thing, isn't it? Right. That's a sort of like, Hey, we are both. So this is not, it's, it's personal. It's not impersonal. Like, Hey, I'm looking for committed relationship. It's personal to you. Like we are going to agree to basically ex date exclusively. And if we want to hear a set of agreements that just give some substance to what that actually looks like. Yeah. And you know, so, so, the question becomes a establishing what your standard is. So um, my standard was before I met my beloved and there's a picture of her right there. Mm -hmm. my, and we met on a dating site. It happened to be even long distance, which I'm not a big proponent of long distance, but we established very early on what our standard was. So my standard at a minimum was to spend three or four days and nights a week together doing shared activities, hobbies, mutual interests, spending time with family and friends, traveling together, teamwork, building skills, both in our personal and our professional life, intimacy, both physical and emotional intimacy that leads to either moving in together, or getting married. That was my standard. That was my box. We had to work around that box because of the distance, but her yeah. lifestyle blended so well with mine that within 90 days, we actually chose within a 90 day period to move in together, uh, which occurred five months after we first met. Let me just quickly give you a backstory, but we'd been talking on and off for a year. So it wasn't a total stranger. Okay. I mean. Yeah. But we were like, look, if this is going to work, and she had the flexibility of moving and she had children who lives here. Um, we're like, if this is going to work, we got to either she has to live here or move in together. We were fully committed to taking the risk, um, you know, both a financial risk and, a, yeah. and a, a, you know, a, a, because we thought that this was worth it. You know, most people these days, I'm going to be candid with you, Jack. I think dating today is just a strung out version of friends with benefits with some minor agreement to monogamy and exclusivity, which, and I say it, I say it, I say it almost, um, not cavalierly, I say it almost from a caustic perspective is there's really no commitment. And yet, remember I said, women are the gatekeepers of sex and men are the gatekeepers of, of, of commitment. Yeah. A guy doesn't have to give much commitment to get laid on a regular basis. So let's imagine for a moment that you, I don't know your audience is, is predominantly women, but let's just yeah. say that you were, you were working with a guy and yeah. you were trying to enroll him um, in why a committed relationship might be good for him, right? Not just because she wants to have a committed relationship, but sort of like in an internally owned, like, I also want this, or, or yeah. um, I, I'm in the box that you're talking about. I'm ready to be in a committed relationship. Just to kind of get into the male psychology of that, what do you think is most in that for guys? I, a great question. So I believe the man who is emotionally grown up, okay, mm -hmm. has emotional maturity. In other words, he's not 
overly affected by childhood wounds and traumas, and he's not overly affected by uh, adult traumas. And his the life, uh, like the the foundation of his life is solid. Let me give you an yeah. example. He's not dealing with a contentious divorce. Yeah. He's not dealing with children issues. He's not dealing with professional issues, and he's not dealing with very many health issues. I'm saying for the most part. I mean, yeah. if we all have little bits in here, but if if your if the ground underneath you doesn't feel solid, yeah, then oftentimes all you're interested is in casual relationship. But if you're, you know, you're a, a guy who, is, you know. He's got his shit together, so to speak. And I don't mean he's wealthy or anything like that, but just he's not overly dealing with with problems. OK. And he's attracted to the woman he's talking with. He's physically attracted to her. The incentive is, look, dating is a fucking bitch. Excuse my <laughs> here. It's just I mean, look at do you really want to be swiping all day long? You know, I mean, I, I know I reached a saturation point four years ago, you know, before I met my beloved. I reached a like, this is just, it's exhausting mm -hmm. to constantly. Now, when I said emotionally healthy, it's also, you're not looking for the bigger, better deal all the time. You, We have a lot of, you know, yeah, success and, and who are players and they're constantly seeking that next thrill. So dating becomes a serial component for them because they ex just expect the next high. Yeah, you use the term sobriety. I'm, I'm you know, self-control to some degree is about going, look, I don't want to be on this merry-go-round. So that's the incentive, one. And number two, I'm, I'm a woman who wants to co-create. Are you a man who wants to co-create? Because if you do, and by the way, my clientele is using this hardballing technique. And it's actually a lot of men are going, Oh my God, this makes my job so much easier. You've already laid it out for me. <laughs> I don't have to, it's already there. If they buy into it, they're like, God, you just made it easy for me. Yeah. Yeah. The alignment's easier. So just to dimensionalize that, let's say someone's hearing that and they're like, Oh, I like the idea of a co-creative partnership. Yeah. Right. Man or woman or however you identify. Yeah. Um, what do you think are some of the elements of of a co-creative partnership? Like how would someone know that they're in one or what what is the possibility of that? So I, I happen to be a big fan of the, the work of the Gottmans, the Gottman Institute, mm -hmm. um, John and Julie Gottman in particular. And they wrote a book called Eight Dates. Mm -hmm. Now, what this is, is eight separate conversations to have with someone to determine if you're on the same page, starting with trust and commitment being the first chapter. And so, um, and the second chapter is about what's calling agreeing to disagree, learning conflict resolution skills. Yeah. So there's a blueprint that exists, uh, both in their book, Eight Dates and the Seven Principles for Mayoring, Making a Marriage Successful. What I mean to say is, these are people that thought, you know, this is a guy who was much like, Oh, can I rewind for a second and just share something? I'll come back to Gottman in a second. Okay. When I was going through divorce, um, my wife and I had to go to family court, uh, which I was wished we didn't have to, but I sat there listening to four other couples going through their, basically laying their dirty laundry. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me that, wait a minute, if this is what causes divorce, shouldn't we reverse engineer that so we never get there mm -hmm. that's what the gottmans have done they have predicted where most failures in relationship occur and then reinvent or, or, or connected the dots you know reverse engineered it to say well this is what you can do to avoid this happening it requires two people being intentional and you know Women tend to be more that way. Women buy relationship books at you know ninefold greater than men, most likely. That's my that's a prediction on my part. That's not a fact. Okay. I've heard it. Yeah. I mean, so so if that's the case, women ha have a container of knowledge that the men don't. So then it becomes introducing it to a man. And 
look at, I jokingly say the following, you know, ladies, you can sit in your feminine energy and hope to be claimed by a guy, but just recognize this. Most men are rather clueless. You are in charge of your relationship destiny. And quite frankly, you are the container to develop the emotional aspect of the relationship because you're better trained at it than we are. Mm -hmm. So yeah. don't be afraid to establish that standard and boundary for yourself because the right guy is going to go, thank God, you just made my job easier. And men want it. Men do want it easy. It's okay to be the emotional leader of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And yet most of you are afraid. So you accept casual, you accept crumbs in many cases, hoping that magic fairy dust will change a guy who is not had, does not have commitment on the forethought of his mind. And commitment is really these days, either want to live together or get married. I'm not a Puritan, but I now recognize why marriage was so valuable mm. because men can string you along sexually. Like I said, dating has become a strung out version of friends with benefits. Okay. That's my rant. I, I, I don't, I, I'm curious to hear if you agree or disagree with me. Well, uh, so on, on the, on the question of, um, you know, why might you be in a, in a, in a, like a co-creative partnership? Yeah. Right? My, my imagination is that for a lot of people, if they're oriented towards growth, yes. the relationship is the, is the best, fastest, and sometimes hardest, but kind of yeah. Tourist, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, right. Like, um, I mean, I sometimes talk about the intractable domain, right? There's a lot of us have a domain, sometimes multiple domains of life that just seem kind of hard, right? For some people, yeah. it might be making money or, finding home it might be relationship it might be health um but i know a lot of people who you know their career is you know yeah there's ups and downs but generally you know they're happy with their career or they've got good things going on the career is not going to teach them the same thing that actually coming into contact with another human being is particularly when it comes to some of the stuff you're talking about you know the inheritance of our childhoods which we're all going to have in some some way shape or form yeah um i'm i guess i'm just curious if um as many men are are looking at it that way as women as like you know because you know I, i've seen both with clients and just in the marketplace a lot of a lot of profiles from women saying look i'm looking for basically an adventure travel buddy right? yeah. i say i don't want kids but i want an adventure travel buddy and i want someone i can grow with and that variation of someone i can grow with is quite a common way of women talking about what they're looking for in dating and i'm curious you know i haven't seen as many male dating profiles i'm as curious if, yeah. if men are on that same page that, Hey, if we, if we're not doing the family thing, or it's not the time of life now to do that, am I looking for someone to grow with? Am I looking for someone to help me be a better human being yeah. and make me more conscious? Um, cause I, I have a suspicion that there might be slightly more women in that category who are like oh. wanting to use the relationship to grow and be more conscious. Yeah. I, I would say that while there is a significant percentage of women who have also gone through a divorce and they're less likely to grow with someone, I mean, or at least really fully commit to another person, uh, there's a big percentage of that. Let me just share with you. And especially yeah. in the demographic that I talk to in the 50, 60 year old demographic, because they might be on a second marriage. Um, and that's another factor to consider yeah. is both how many how many times a person has been married or how many multiple relationships they've had. Yeah, because with each relationship, relationship, your desire for commitment begins to become can not does, but yes. can yeah. become, you know, almost non-existent. OK, with that said, though, I think genuinely speaking, women have a propensity to want commitment more so than men. Yes. OK. And to grow with someone. OK, um, it's but here's the thing, as I say in my videos, most men are good guys. They're just bad daters. They haven't had anyone really lead them in the in the in how to grow a relationship. So all here's the bottom line is, is this. You need a man who's open to your way of thinking or your methodology. OK. And a lot of women are scared because, you know, we've been so indoctrinated. Men are the leaders and women just have to accept a man's direction to some degree. Yeah. So when you're saying your methodology, what, what do you mean by that? Is that you take charge of your relationship destiny, particularly by being the emotional leader of the relationship. So it might look like, hey, I've got this thing called the book Eight Dates. It's a blueprint to help us 
grow as a couple. Are you interested in doing this with me? And a man might say, oh my God, therapy, that's the, I'm, I'm against all that, blah, blah, blah. Well, then you know you have a closed-minded person. So quickly, you want to determine, are they open-minded or closed-minded? Yeah, I hear and, that. And, you know, do you, do you have any advice just on that, right? Let's say someone is listening to this and they are in a relationship with a man, right? Yeah. But they, they want to do something like that. They want to, you know, go to a seminar, get therapy, and the guy is, is being resistant. Do you have any tips to help a woman in that situation other than perhaps, okay, this might be that it's not actually going to work out? You know, like, that's well, an option. you know, we could use some of the terminology. I would feel so good if you do this for me and believing that men want to please women, you know, but if someone is resistant to it, it doesn't matter how, how much you say it feels good for me to do this. If someone's resistant, then the question becomes, where is their resistance coming from? And yeah. maybe have a dialogue about where that resistance coming from and maybe had a childhood wound or a trauma or an adult trauma that has gone unhealed. And maybe, I mean, at some level, it's. I think it's important to say, look, if you're not on the same page with me, I'm going to go find somebody who is on the same page with me, not yeah. be fearful. So I'm not saying you draw a line in the sand, but ultimately, look at women on average spend five years with the wrong guy. And this happens habitually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, and I'm picking that number, you know, yeah. slightly, you know, but I get you it. Can, so you know, when I hear it, what you're saying is, in a sense, if there is significant resistance, probabilistically, what I hear you say is it's maybe not a good fit for you. Maybe actually you should start looking elsewhere rather than perhaps here's the here's the way that you enroll a guy like you can explore what his fear is. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, maybe it is linked to some kind of trauma. Yeah, maybe for some guys, unless they've seen the value of therapy, they don't see the value of therapy. You know what I mean? Like they've, they've, they've got to have some kind of. Um, uh, sense that it's either valuable um, or is going to help them or help the help the relationship. Well, you can always accept the man the way he is, you know, and just accept it and accept the relationship. But be careful if it's a dependent type of relationship. Is certainly a, a, a particularly when we think of it from a monetary perspective. But a lot of times, women accept. Me, you know, mediocre, and I'm characterizing that because it's better to have a mediocre relationship than no relationship right. at all. It's better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not, a, I'm not a advocate for that by any stretch of the means, but I'm certainly understand why so many women, you know, will accept casual because it's better. You know, life is better with company. The problem becomes at any given moment that person will leave, and then do you really look at? We also have to fear death too. Sometimes that's the catalyst for, for a relationship to end. Yeah, uh, and I'm yeah. talking about for those of us yeah. that are oh, in sure. this age demographic. Um, yeah. But ultimately, growth, in my opinion, is the fun part of the journey. You know, by by establishing. Yeah. You know, I dated a woman once. This is before I met my beloved, which my my sweetheart and I devote one day a month to absolute you know, absolutely really a, a day and a half to really work on stuff in our relationship. Yeah. And we know. do it in a very spiritual way. And, and along with throughout the day, throughout the week, we do things, but there is a devoted day. Yeah. I date a woman who did something called church. Instead of physically going to church, we listened to a personal development CD for an hour and a half. And then we talked about it. Well, yeah. that was personal development. What about a relationship, you know, uh, podcast? and talk about what was discussed and having a dialogue with someone. And, you know, to me, rich dialogue with a partner is kind of the reason why I get up in the morning to spend with my beloved, because we have these deep, rich conversations yeah. and we Never. both like each other. <laughs> thing. So you know, let me ask you this. Um, sure. so you've talked about this aspect of uh, sort of dependency when I, I think, yeah. Ultimately, you're talking about financial dependency. Well, that's one important vector of it. Um, yeah. Do you have any uh, view about, uh, let's say, a, a woman who doesn't need a guy to do that, but maybe still has some desire that the guy is pretty, you know, not necessarily wealthy, but kind of financially set, responsible, showing up in that domain? Um, are you counseling people ag against getting into more mutually commingled, financially dependent relationship? Um, uh, is there a sense that if that's not happening for some for some women, it might never 
feel quite as, as sort of full as a relationship where maybe that is happening. Um, what, what, what do you think about so, that? So, well, let's just kind of look at the United States for a moment. Roughly 80% of the population makes less than $100,000 a year. Yeah. That's just, you know, and, and roughly about 90% of the population have less than, you know, they, they couldn't be out of work for three months without suffering a su substantial um, financial, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. potential calamity. So, okay, so we know some of these facts to be true. The reality is, is most people aren't, you know, uh, we were talking about a podcast earlier where they talk about, you know, athletes and ballers and stuff like that, you know, the richest of the rich and then the Kardashians. Are, that's not that's not the average person. The average person sure. has a job making 50 grand, 75 yeah. grand a year. In my opinion, is two incomes is better than one. OK, mm -hmm. so while you might seek someone to take care of you financially, that means you're going to have to be in a position to attract someone if that's the case. Or you can say two incomes is better than one. And let's say you're a woman who made 75 grand a year and you're with a man who made 65 grand a year. Well, that's combined as 140 a year. You, If you're in a committed relationship with this person, if you live together, you can combine resources. The reality is, is um, while traditionally men have always had the opportunity to continually create resources, we're seeing a shift in that dramatically as people age. And so I think it's better to view it two is better than one and mm -hmm. not from a, and so if you have to come, if you're a woman who has to come at it from a dependency stage, then you might have to settle for, you might be, have to settle in certain areas of your life. And it's a, and a lot of people don't wanna settle you know, um, you know, they want yeah. their cake and eat it too. This is women as well as men. You know, men want to have more physical attractiveness. Women tend to have one or men with established and resources. But I'm yeah. here to say two is better than one. So it sounds like that's, I haven't really put it in this language. It sounds like you're saying better than dependence is interdependence. And really what you're saying two is better than one is kind of like, yeah, we're going we're gonna to both put into the pot but it, it's really more of an interdependent than one way dependent kind of relationship. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So we're probably coming to the, the sort of end of our time here. So yeah. just to tie us back to where we started, right? Women sure. accept casual when they're looking for commitment, right? So let's yeah. say right now someone's listened to this and if, if they're tuning into themselves, they're like, yep, yeah, that probably does apply to me. Do you have any kind of message of um, support, hope, like, what would you say to a person who's like, yep, that's kind of happening for me right now? Sure. I, and that's a great question. So I, I would venture, I, first and foremost, is w certainly work on oneself, whether it's healing childhood wounds and traumas or adult traumas. So you can actually show up to be a full participant in relationship. Number two, there yeah. are a lot of good men out there. There's a yeah. lot of good men out there. They're just bad at the dating process. So rather than judge men as as with an expectation of being good at this, just accept that they're bad at it. Just like it's accepting that men want sex on a first date. That's just, let's just call those givens, but not with, with no judgment, okay? Your job as a woman, or at least my invitation for you, is to yeah. do a better job of weeding out, you know, the wrong men sooner rather than later. Because that puts, like, even what I teach my coaching is my job is to put the odds in your favor because yeah. we're dealing with a population that is rather dysfunctional to some degree, some more than others. Okay? Wait, you mean the dating pool of men? Is that what you yeah, mean? well, dating pool of men and women, believe okay. me, the dysfunctionality. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's there's people with clinical issues, there's people that are dysfunctional, and there's a there's a range of that dysfunctionality. And then there's certainly men who are growers and builders that I talk about. Those are that have that capacity. And there are plenty of men out there. Sometimes you have to be a little bit more patient at the same time having your standards. So yeah. I'm all about laying your cards on the table. Yeah. There, if there's if there's mutual yeah, physical ahead. attraction, then lay your cards on the table sooner rather than, than playing the game of like, of not, listen, a lot of people say dating should just, just have fun, just have a good time. It's all about having a good time. Well, here's the problem. You have a good time for too long without pre-qualifying that person and then you're attached to someone yeah. and then you, well you find yourself you know six weeks later going oh i just got dumped by a guy 
because I didn't do my job. Yeah, it's it's a job. And God, guess what? You may not like the job. You may despise the idea of a job or you can say, you know what? Being strategic can be fun, too. Yeah. And and you can not I'm not saying play it as a game, but no, just think be treat, smart. Yeah. yeah, be smart and just be and always come at it from a place of of gratitude and curiosity and just go, I'm just going to be curious and open and see where it goes. And if it doesn't work out, that's OK, too. But by doing this, you put the odds in your favor. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. It sounds like not being afraid to claim what it is that you're actually looking for. Exactly. To your point earlier, realizing that that probably will repel most men. Right? Yeah. You said 90%. Yeah, I get it. And actually learning how to tolerate that rather than tolerate the difficulty of starting to attach to someone who's not really available to be attached to. Exactly. Well yeah. said, Jack. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, look, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom. Um, if you want more of Jonathan, just look beneath this video. You'll be able to head over to his channel. Check it out. And uh, for everyone who's been here watching, appreciate it. Look forward to being with you again on the channel. And all the best with your dating. Thanks. Thanks so much.